Hey, in this video I want to compare the CO2 emissions of different modes of travel. In the past I've traveled a lot but didn't think about the environmental impacts. I've traveled to faraway places at least once a year and mostly by airplane. Aviation is responsible for only 3 to 5 percent of human caused CO2 emissions. For my personal footprint, air travel made up almost half of it. By changing my travel behavior, I could reduce my CO2 footprint significantly. And if a lot of people followed suit, we could shut down a lot more airports like the old Tempelhof airfield in Berlin. For my university program, I was doing an exchange semester in Arizona in the US last year. I started my journey in Cologne, Germany, which is almost 10,000 kilometers away from Phoenix. There are no direct flights from Cologne to Phoenix, so if I wanted to fly, I would have to change at least once, for example in London. Flying from Cologne to London causes about 80 kilograms of CO2 per person and another 846 kilograms to Phoenix. A one-way trip from Germany to Arizona therefore causes the emission of almost one ton of carbon dioxide. To put this into perspective, let's have a look at the global CO2 emissions caused by humans. Ever since the start of industrialization, anthropogenic carbon dioxide production has risen continuously to more than 40 billion tons of CO2 per year. To limit global warming to roughly 2 degrees, we have to limit the amount of carbon produced. Models used by the International Panel on Climate Change IPCC, predict this can be achieved if CO2 emissions stay within the blue area. This would mean we have to reduce greenhouse gas production quickly and achieve net zero emissions well before the end of the century. But right now it's more likely that emissions will increase further, leading to a future in which the average global temperature has risen over 4 degrees Celsius until 2100. This gray area represents the total amount of CO2 we can emit to stay under the 2 degree threshold, and we have already used up more than half of it. If we divide the remaining carbon budget through the current world population, each of us gets to emit an average of 2.5 tons of CO2 each year until the end of the century. The return flight from Cologne to Phoenix would use up three quarters of my individual carbon budget. Therefore, I looked for alternative ways to travel from Germany to the US. I took an overnight bus from Cologne to London. From there, I took the train to the port of Liverpool, where I boarded a freighter ship going to the US. The ship went straight across the Atlantic to Philadelphia in 10 days. Then I took a train to New Orleans, which took another 33 hours, and then another one and a half days on a bus until I finally reached Phoenix. Adding up the CO2 emissions of all the different travel segments yields a total carbon footprint of about 250 kilograms of CO2 for a one-way trip. This is a bit more than one quarter of the emissions caused by traveling that distance on an airplane. But this journey would have only taken me about 16 hours when flying compared to the 15 days it took me to get there. To calculate the emissions for the different methods of transport I used scientific literature. The lower emission assessments for short-haul flights yield about 150 grams of CO2 per person and kilometer. Long-haul flights have lower emissions per kilometer due to the higher elevations and the shorter wait times at approach compared to the total travel times. The conservative estimate of 100 grams per person and kilometer is roughly the same as the emissions of a car with two people. A diesel-powered train emits about 65 grams and a bus 28 at 60% occupancy. I could not find any studies on CO2 emissions caused by container cruises. There are just too few people traveling this way. So I estimated the weight of me and my luggage and assumed I was cargo. This yields CO2 emissions of 1.2 grams per kilometer for me traveling on a sub Panamax vessel. This calculation is probably simplifying things a lot. I did not account for the extra space allocated for me, for the food that was cooked for me, or the water that was desalinated and heated for me showering on board. But since a container ship is not built for passenger travel, its routes do not depend on the number of travelers. So the cabin would just be empty if I would not be there. And even if the CO2 emissions of the Atlantic crossing would be two or three times higher, my total travel emissions 
would still be more than three times less compared to flying. A factor I didn't consider for air travel so far is that of emissions in the atmosphere. IPCC estimates that we have to multiply CO2 emissions by a factor of 2 to 4 if they are emitted up in the air. That is because of the effects on atmospheric chemistry and the way energy is reflected back to the Earth's surface. This factor has been disputed and scientists have argued that it is misleading to come up with a fixed factor independent of the time span we are looking at. But even the most critical scientists find a factor of 1.7 for a time span of around 100 years. Air travel is a privilege very few globally can afford. Therefore, CO2 emissions from aviation are comparatively low. Energy production and agriculture contribute much more to global warming. But individually, it's much easier to reduce one's travel emissions than to change the way agriculture is done. In 2016, I reduced my CO2 footprint by at least one third by taking the ship instead of flying. I think we need to work for change on both levels simultaneously, the individual and the structural. So I have decided that I will avoid flying whenever possible.